the cloud of witnesses around us, their lives of faith in courage and surround us. Here come the master, praise their faith so fervent. Well done, my servant. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. sinful and unclean, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, give thanks. 
thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The stone that the builders has rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you gave your Son into the hands of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your unfailing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost 
is from Isaiah chapter 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. The word of the Lord. The epistle is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made, has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. 
When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Text for our meditation this day is from the epistle reading from the third chapter of Philippians. Dear friends in Christ Jesus our Lord, keep your eyes on the goal. Whether it was advice we heard when we were a student at school or advice that we heard in later adult years, or merely something that the passing years have taught us through the experiences of life, it nevertheless is still good advice. Those who wander aimlessly through life will always hit their goal. That is, they will make no mark and accomplish nothing significant in life. But if you want to attain a college or graduate degree, or if you want to do well in an athletic contest, or if you want to purchase a new car and deal with those guys that sell them, or if you want to purchase a new home, or if you want to move up the ladder in the business world, then it's always important to keep your eyes on a goal. Establishing a goal enables you to measure your progress as you are moving forward. And if it is true of life in general, as I believe it is, it's just as true in the Christian faith. It's for that reason that the Apostle Paul writes the words of this text from our epistle reading for this morning. Hear again what he says. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now from those words, it's obvious that the Apostle Paul is moving toward a goal. And that means that he has not yet reached it. If your eyes are on the goal, you have a ways to go yet to get there. And St. Paul readily admits that reality in this morning's epistle. Not that I have already achieved it or am already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of the prize for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. There is a general misconception about people in the world in which we live, in society in general. They think that Christian people like us think we have the notion that we are perfect. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. But there is great truth in that bumper sticker that you see once in a while that reads, Christians are not perfect just forgiven. And how could it be otherwise? After all, Christian people are part of the human race, and the whole human race has been corrupted by sin. We are all part of a fallen humanity. We are intent upon satisfying our own will rather than God's desires. Instead of honoring God as first in our hearts and first in our lives, we're quite content to give him a corner of our attention, to worship occasionally, to throw a few dollars into the offering plate, so long as the demands are not too great. And yet at the same time, we serve our own interests, our own needs. We put our own appetites first. If we examine our lives according to God's Ten Commandments, then we will certainly see that we've done a miserable job of keeping them. We've transgressed God's law and dishonored the very God who has given us life. You and I, my friends, are the wicked tenants of the vineyard in the parable we find in the gospel this day. We have mistreated God's servants who have come to us. We refuse to give heed to our God 
or to give him the return that he rightfully deserves from his investment in us. And that is why when we come into God's house as we did again this morning for worship, we must begin always confessing our sin. Like the Apostle Paul, we must start out with his same confession. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect. But of course, in Scripture, there is also good news, isn't there? The good news is the gospel that God saw our separation and our sinfulness. God acted as he sent his own son into our world. Our Lord lived as the perfect man we were all designed to be and will never be. Our Lord offered up his perfect life as a sacrifice at Calvary's cross in order that our debt to sin might be paid in full. The plan of salvation has been completed in every detail. By the grace of our God, we have been reconciled through the blood of Jesus Christ. The chasm between God and us has been forever bridged. We are God's restored and forgiven people through the blood of Christ shed at the cross. And what does that mean for all of us? It means that we are free of the past. It means that we were forgiven by our God and that all of the past has been forgotten by him. We are now clothed in the perfect righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are his reconciled, restored, and forgiven people. And we can move on as we continue to grow in our faith. Paul says it so well in the words of this text. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on. We can forget what is behind us as we move on, growing in our faith and serving our Lord. But for altogether too many Lutheran people, that's the end of the faith rather than the beginning. Paul, on the other hand, looked at it as a beginning. Certainly there were a lot of skeletons in Paul's closet. As a Pharisee, he had opposed the Christian faith. He had imprisoned new Christians. He had been there at the martyrdom of St. Stephen and perhaps had been one of the very ones who had cast a stone that brought about his death. He had worked with all the power at his disposal to stamp out that Christian faith. But on the road to Damascus that day, it was the voice of Jesus himself who said to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? But God brought Saul to faith in Christ. Suddenly the one who was the persecutor became the missionary. All that was in the past was now in the past, and the slight had been wiped clean. Paul no longer had to be haunted by the sins of his past. He could move on proclaiming Jesus Christ. He boldly shared with both Jew and Gentile alike. Through his missionary journeys, many a congregation of the Christian faith was founded, and many people were brought to saving faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But you see, the important thing was that Paul moved on in his faith. He knew that he must serve his Lord. He simply had to share the good news that had brought such a dramatic and remarkable change in his own life. The sad thing is that it's not the same for us. Many of us are content to exist on the faith we had on the day of our confirmation. We don't grow because we don't study God's word. We know full well what would happen to us if someday we decided to stop eating. 
there would initially be that gnawing, empty feeling in the pit of our stomach. That would be followed by a loss of weight, a loss of strength, and even the possibility of illness. And the end or result of our failure to eat would be starvation. And yet many a Christian is spiritually malnourished and hungry because he refuses to move on in his faith. We need to feast upon God's word and sacrament so that we can move forward and grow as members of the family of God. Paul knew he had work to do, and so do we. So he set the goal constantly in front of himself. One thing I do, he said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul had to move on in his faith as he worked in God's kingdom. The analogy he uses is that of an athlete. Now I have to confess to you that I've never been an athlete. Never have been, never will be. On the other hand, it may surprise you to know that some years in my past, I did participate in a few five kilometer and 10 kilometer runs. Never to win, simply to participate. And I know from experience that there is only one important thing in an event like that. It's always keeping your eyes finished on the finish line. If you watch the people who are in front of you or those who are passing you by, it's easy to get distracted. If you look to those on the sidelines who may be cheering you on, you'll certainly be left behind. You must always train your eyes on the finish line as you move toward the goal. That's even more true for the Christian of the 21st century. Our goal must always, always, always be in sight. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There is a goal to the Christian life, and we know what it is. It is to be in the presence of the Lord himself. It is to live with our Lord for all eternity. Even as we live here on this earth, we must always keep that goal in sight. The world in which we live has many attractions and many pleasures. But this world is not our permanent home. Paul reminds us at the end of this reading, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, our Lord Jesus Christ. Eternal life in heaven is the ultimate goal and destination of our journey. And our Lord Jesus Christ is the only way to that destination. But that does not mean we should not pay attention to our lives in the here and now. I've now been in the pastoral ministry for a little over 52 years. It dawned on me just the other day that I've now been retired from the active ministry for 12 years. But I know that for me, there's still a lot yet to do in the ministry. Some time ago, since Marion and I were getting older, we recognized we weren't very far from retirement. So we did something that was the right thing to do. We consulted a financial planner. And he immediately asked us some questions that were pretty hard to answer. What is your goal? What would you like to do in your retirement? What kind of an income level would make you feel comfortable? And then after we established a goal, he was able to direct our planning. He was able to suggest that 
besides my retirement pension and our Social Security income, it would be wise to establish individual retirement accounts. We knew the goal, but it was important to us to be directed toward the means of accomplishing that goal. There were many ways and means to consider, but we needed to be guided and directed to the best path of attaining that goal. And so it is with our Christian faith. We know that we began our journey like Paul, in an imperfect condition. Like him, we can truly say, not that I have already obtained all this or already been made perfect, but we know, praise God, we have received the perfect forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know the certain goal and end of our journey is eternal life with our Lord. But we do need to pay attention to our lives right here in this world. We need to press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. And how shall we press on? Certainly, my friends, we need to worship. There is nothing that so strengthens and nourishes our faith as God's word and sacraments. We come together as we have again this morning to confess our sin. We come together again to be assured of Christ's forgiveness. We come together again to hear God's direction for our lives. We come together again to participate in that feast of victory in which we receive Christ's presence through his own body and blood given and shed for us. And we come together again to be strengthened and supported through the companionship and strength of other brothers and sisters who share our faith. And my friends, there is no substitute for that worship as we press on toward the goal. When we miss that, we are missing something very significant and uplifting. We must do, move on toward the goal as we make use of God's word. There are those in the world who think of Holy Scripture as an ancient and outmoded document that had to do with people thousands of years ago that has little relevance for 21st century life. Well, you know what? The Christian knows better. God's word is his word of encouragement, his word of guidance for life in the troubled times in which we live. That word enables us to confront our sin on a daily basis. That word gives us the comfort and the assurance of knowing that our Lord knows the trials and frustrations that we go through on a daily basis. That word even gives us guidance for the relationships that we share with other people and the decisions that we are called to make each and every day of life. We need to use that word of God to take stock of our lives. We need to use that word to direct our paths. We need to use that word to measure the progress we are making as we move forward in the Christian faith to which God has called us. We need to constantly use that word to ask ourselves, how have I grown in my faith this past year? And how can that word direct me in my spiritual growth and progress in the life God has given me? As we watch our children and grandchildren grow, and I do a lot of that in retirement, we don't always notice it because it takes place gradually. But often, we notice it at the beginning of a new school year. We notice the pants no longer fit. They look like they were caught in a flood. And the shoes have been outgrown. It's time to buy some back-to-school clothes. 
Our children have grown while they were sleeping and when we were not looking. But it must also be true in our spiritual lives. Like the Apostle Paul, we need to continue to grow, continue to press on, continue to make progress in growing through the faith God has given us. Are we growing in the Christian faith? It can only happen as we worship. It can only happen as we make use of the Word of God. It can only happen as we take advantage of the community of saints that God has given us right here in this congregation. So let us keep on growing in faith as we follow the advice of the apostle who went before us in that faith. I press on, he says, toward the goal, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Set your eyes on the goal and keep on pressing on. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, will keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen. We rise as we join in confessing the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. O Lord, you have planted, nurtured, and hedged around your vineyard, the Church, you sent your dear Son to give his life for her. Inspire her by your Holy Spirit to yield much fruit for your kingdom and grant that many find shelter on her holy hill. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, since your Son has made his own by his death, grant that we may share in his sufferings with confidence and that we may also know the power of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, grant all orphans a safe place in which to grow and thrive. Bring into their lives generous couples who will open their hearts to give them permanent homes through adoption. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Shine your light upon us, O Lord, that we may do what is good and right and live as faithful citizens in our nation. Bless Joseph, our president, Eric, our governor, and all those elected and appointed to make, administer, and judge our laws. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Divine vine dresser, 
you prune those whom you love. Strengthen our hearts to heed your law, that we may never presume to sin, nor trust in our own deeds, but look to the rainfall of your grace for our source of life. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you bring forth from this barren earth a holy people to press forward to your heavenly goal. Direct our zeal toward your good and gracious purpose and prosper the work of the hands that labor in your name. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's body and blood in this holy supper. Strengthen us in faith and renew us in love by this holy communion. Bring us at last with all the saints to dwell in your everlasting presence. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Lord, you sing the song of your love over the vineyard of your church. Lift her united voice through your spirit that she in turn would freely praise your lavish grace and proclaim your salvation beyond her walls. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We worship the Lord with our offering. You may greet one another with the peace of the Lord. And we join together in singing the offertory. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who having created all things took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead, 
to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore we join with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven to laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore singing. Isaiah, mighty seer in days of old, the Lord of all in spirit did behold. High on a lofty throne in splendor bright, with robes of Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
declare of your mercy, you would strengthen us with the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
And that's going to be the speaker's list. 10.30, 10 o'clock or 12 noon. And uh, keep Pastor Rick and his family in your prayers as he's traveling and then he comes back uh, refreshed and ready to start his work for his ministry here. Are there any announcements in the congregation? If not, uh, we will be having Bible class after church and there's snacks and refreshments there as well. Thank you.